Hey, Sanctus Church, good morning. So glad that you're joining us today, wherever you might be, in a physical location, online, and maybe you're watching this somewhere in the world, no matter who you are, where you're from, where you're coming from, glad you're here today. We're back in the book of Romans. We're going to be in the second half of chapter 8, but before I get there, let me begin with this. I don't do well with blood. Like, I really don't do well with blood. I, I'm just one of those guys where if I see a little too much of it, I might go down myself. Now, the crazy thing is that my wife uh, had three kids with me, and all of them were C-sections. And when I arrived at the hospital, of course, for the first one, I'm like freaking out. I'm nervous. I've never done this before, of course, and I'm not even doing the difficult work. And then I suddenly realized that, no, no, I'm going to be in the operating room well, this is happening, and I'm like panicking, and I just totally remember my wife is laying on the table, and then they put up like this little curtain, and so my wife's head is behind the curtain, and I'm hiding behind the curtain, trying to encourage my wife, and she's talking to me, and I'm just staring at her or staring at this curtain because I don't want to see blood, and of course, of course, of course, there is blood falling here and there, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And then, and then I have this experience I've never forgotten. I've now had it three times where I discovered something called the placenta. Um, I knew about them from biology. I never thought I'd see one in my life. Uh, I got to see it. It overwhelmed me deeply. God invented them. They're great. They're amazing. I just, anyway, that's fine. And then, of course, I was invited to cut the umbilical cord, which I did with all three kids as I was literally stepping over the thing that freaks me out. And then, of course, after all of that, there's joy. There's this incredible experience of holding a human being that's yours. And then, of course, there's the doing all the stuff next. That's the image I want in your mind, the messiness of that moment. Why? Well, watch this. Pain, messiness, C-section, labor, joy. One person years ago wrote these words about chapter 8. Many of us have pictures, he writes, with our wives after they deliver a baby. Typically, the baby's in their arms. He says the mother's radiant. I'd say sometimes the mothers are really exhausted and tired. And then he says, but none of us have a picture at our wallet, dating it, or iPhone or Android, of our wives in labor. We don't reach into our phones or wallets and say, let me show you a picture of my wife groaning in labor. Isn't the agony terrific? And... That's Paul's coming point. Creation one day is going to be delivered, and the difference between then and now, the difference is agony and ecstasy. And it's living in the in-between. Think about what's going to happen. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before. Where nature is going to one day be free to produce as it was designed to produce, free from pestilence, free from danger. And I... My suspicion is many of you who are Christians have never considered this, that you're actually going to see this with your own eyes. See, this is where Paul begins to go in the second half of Romans 8. Paul, in the first half of the chapter, chapter took us to such heights. He reminded us again and again of what God has done for us. We're not condemned by God. We're not controlled by sin. We've been given God's very spirit. He's filled us. We've been bought. We've been covered. Paul's cried out. We have an amazing father who's never absent, never abandons us, always present, and he calls us to salvation. We have this incredible savior, this incredible high priest, this incredible brother who substitutes his own life life for us. We have this a residing, empowering comforter, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. It's like a literal nuclear reactor inside of us, giving us holiness and love. We're adopted. We're God's children. We're co-heirs with Christ. And all of this has produced in us, given to us, something fought for, longed for, sung about, written about, fantasized about in our world. It's security and identity. We're literally given the power to become more and more like Jesus. But then at the end of last week, the issue of suffering, agony, groaning came up. All the pain and garbage of life. And the question we began to wrestle with is, well, how do I reconcile all the incredible things that God has done in my life? All the amazing things God has done in the world I live in. Groans and glory, death and resurrection, pain and promise. This is 
the reality of Christian life, Christian struggle. And Paul is about to say God himself is going to provide all we need as we wait in the middle between agony and ecstasy. But Paul does not hide the fact that Christians suffer. Actually, he faces it head on. And so with poetic, you could say prophetic impulse, Paul gives our world, us, the hope we need with sort of this pastoral tenderness and yet prophetic force. He declares to anyone who would be willing to listen, yeah, creation is really messed up. Yeah, creation is broken. Yes, creation is sick. Yes, creation is dying. But also it will be freed and restored. All of creation is waiting for us, the the, the followers of Jesus, to be, physical, to be physically resurrected. Creation is longing for, waiting for divine interference, which is not about the destruction of creation at the end of time, but the transformation of reality and restoration of the whole universe, physical and spiritual, back to the way it was in Eden. But as we wait, there's suffering, there's groaning. The image of labor is about to be used. But the groaning isn't forever. Romans 8, 19. Hear God's word. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. All of reality, it says, is craning its neck, it's stretching forward, is waiting to actually get back which was lost in Eden. Years ago, a guy named Phillips translated this verse brilliantly. He said, the whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons and daughters of God coming into their own. See, at the end of time, when every single Christian is physically resurrected, like Jesus was physically resurrected, at that moment, creation is going to be made right. It's like a two-step dance, us, then everything. Now, this promise, which again, so many of us don't even think about, is so wonderful, it's almost hard to comprehend. And then as we're thinking it, Paul throws us hard back, like really strong back. He gives us like biblical whiplash all the way back to Genesis 3 and reminds us that all this groaning, all this trouble in the world is a result of sin, the consequence of our decisions, of our rebellion. And it just didn't affect us. It literally affected creation, the natural order. Verse 20, for the creation was subject, subjected to frustration. Not by its own choice, but by the will, of one, the will of the one who subjected it in hope. See, when God did everything at the beginning, creation birth forth with color and fragrance and food, and it was a kind place, it was a peaceful place, in, in, in its true sense, it's what we all long for. It was generous. Then God comes along and gives this command, Adam and Eve, do not eat. Which, of course, was affirming that we are made in the image of God because choice is there. And what did we do? Well, we rebelled. We ate, not out of love, not out of relationship, rebellion. And that one solitary act brought all that was very good to be marred and maimed and marked and misused. It got broken. So is there any hope, we ask? Is there any real future? Are the atheistic, evolutionistic thinkers of our day right? There is no end. There is no way out. You can't turn things back. Everything's lost. Lost forever. No redemption. No recreation. The outside rescue is an illusion. No, they're wrong. Verse 21. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. God is going to make all things Right, new heaven, new earth. Bondage and decay will end. There's hope. There's light on the horizon. It spans history itself. One day there will be no more shadow. One day there will be no more pollution. One day there will be no more war. One day there will be no more abuse. One day no one's ever going to get abandoned again. One day there's going to be no more hatred. One day there's going to be no more racism. One day no one's going to hate God. One day no one's going to resist his truth. One day no one's going to weep anymore. One day there's going to be no misunderstandings. One day there is going to be no form of slavery. One day there's going to be no form of addiction. One day hospitals won't be needed. One One day, jails are going to be gone. One day, conflict's going to go away. One day, we'll never be sick again. One day, there's going to be no more funerals. One day, there is no more death. That's what's coming. And then he says this. We know 
that the whole of creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Creation became a sufferer like us. Broken decay and death between the good joyful thing that's coming is this suffering moment. As one wrote, so now at times the forces of nature seem to work against themselves and us. Everywhere our eyes meet images of death and decay, the scourge of barrenness, the fury of the elements, the destructive instincts of beasts, the very laws which govern vegetation. Everything gives nature almost this somber hue. In the animal world, it's full of fear and violence. He says, think about like the National Geographic. You're watching something right on Disney Plus and you're watching the loveliest scene of nature and it's beautiful and it's inspiring and then suddenly there's all this bloody horror in the middle of it. Right? Flood, hurricane, drought, tornado, blight, avalanche, earthquakes, they stalk the earth. Humanity makes the situation worse. It makes this disharmony grow. He says, I've lived in places where the air is too polluted to comfortably breathe. I've walked on beaches which coats, the, coats one's feet with tar. And it's probably true that if humanity, he writes, goes, goes on its way unhindered, the last person on earth will stand at the edge of some petroleum clog sea while behind him rises the twisted skeletons of once great cities. The earth groans like a woman in labor, desperately wanting for this pregnancy to be over, to be delivered. And because we're part and central in creation, we as humans, we groan too. One wrote, the tragedies of financial ruin, broken relationships, natural disasters, terminal illness, and everyone's going to die. And we groan also because of the drag of sin that keeps us from enjoying complete and uninterrupted intimacy with God, our Creator. But that's not the end of the story. We actually, though we're in the middle of this horrific groaning labor moment, are the first fruits of what's coming in a redeemed creation. The Holy Spirit has already brought a taste of the future into the darkness now. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have, have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. See, we're the first fruits. We're the first installment. We're the initial down payment. The Spirit of God has started bringing into the now what's going to be fully coming in the not yet, the new heavens and the new earth. And despite all that amazingness, all that joy and peace and salvation, and all, we still groan inwardly, Paul says. What an honest picture of the human experience. What an honest picture of the Christian walk. We've got hope and we hurt. The lie, and I use that word properly, the lie perpetuated by so many Christian churches, is become a Christian, you get wealthy. Become a Christian, you'll be prosperous. Become a Christian, you'll, your healing is guaranteed. That's broken by Paul's honest declaration. Well, we wait in hope, we groan. Another pet these words, our lives consist of groans. We groan because of the ravages uh, uh, of sin that make our lives marked by them and the lives of the ones we love. And we groan because we see the possibilities that are not being captured and employed. And we groan because we see gifted people who are wasting their lives. And we would love to see something else happening. And we groan in our spirits. And we groan in our disappointments. And we groan in our bereavements. And we groan in our sorrow. We groan physically in our pain. And we grow, groan because of our limitations. Life consists of a great deal of groaning. And yet, there's hope, because at the same time, we're members of another kingdom. Yeah, yeah, this is almost like we are sojourners. We're living in a foreign land. We're behind enemy lines, but the redemption of our bodies is coming. And just like Jesus will be, was physically resurrected, so we're going to be physically resurrected, and then, oh, by the way, everything else is going to be made right too. That's what he says in verse 24. For in this we hope we were saved. For in this hope we were saved. But the hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Salvation is already ours. 
We don't so fully see or understand it, nor do we experience the full effects of Jesus' work in creation or in us, but we've got hope, and it's certain hope, and we are waiting patiently, like all generations of Christians have waited for 2,000 years to see the beginning of the end, which will bring us back to the perfect beginning. So creation groans, and we're groaning, but then Paul goes to a place none of us would ever expect. It should actually take us back. It should shock us just a little. He then says, not just creation and not just us, the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit groans too. The Holy Spirit. (laughs) The same Spirit at creation. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. The, The Spirit of Christ. The same Spirit. The Spirit of life. The great advocate. The great intercessor. The guarantee of right. He groans too? Oh yes. In the same way, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Now, intercession is a form of prayer which means you stand in the gap or you stand in between. And the Holy Spirit stands in the gap or stands in between our groaning, our sin, our brokenness, and the Father. And he prays for us. It says he actually groans. Now, these sighs are such a gift because God knows that we were suffering and are suffering, and he knows where this is going to end. Now, one wrote this. This is important, especially about church history. Speaking to God in the Spirit with tongues, for example, that gift, may be included in this. But this covers the longing and aspirations which well up from the depth of someone's spirit that cannot be imprisoned within the confines of everyday words. In other words, we have all had times as Christians when we don't even know what to pray. We got no words. We got no feelings. We've got no hope. We don't sense God's presence or his power. And it's in that moment where we don't know what to say and we're at a total loss of words. The spirit of God stands in the gap and he articulates the things we want to and don't even know how to. I love when one person wrote years ago, the Holy Spirit does not give armchair advice. He rolls up his sleeves and helps us bear our weakness. That's real help. But see this. (laughs) We really begin to understand the depth of the statement when you think that the Spirit of God groans on our behalf because, have you ever thought about this? Because like Jesus, the Son of God, the Spirit also has to live with the problem of evil. Because he voluntarily, willfully, joyfully chooses to live in me. And if you're a Christian, you. We live lives all the time where we keep on sinning. He's there. The Holy Spirit chooses to live literally in broken vessels. He chooses to stay in people that ignore him sin against him, and grieve him. And he keeps staying because he loves us. Why does he love us? Because Jesus loves us. Why does Jesus love us? Because the Father loves us. The Spirit of God who convicts us of sin, leads us into all truth. He he guarantees our resurrection. He suffers with us. He comes alongside of us. That's why he's called our comforter. And if that's not enough, never forget, his prayers are never wrong, never misplaced, never tainted by sin or ego or want. My dad who's experienced a lot of pain in his life and a lot of groaning, always has loved this verse. He's always told me, you know, John, God takes my broken, messed up, sometimes sinfully tainted prayers and he makes them right and makes them pure and prays for me. See, that's why the next verse is so important. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Notice, (laughs) I love this, Every Christian on earth is called a saint. A saint is one who is called by God and saved by Jesus. It's not someone who lives an exceptional Christian life. A saint is a holy one. You're made holy through Jesus. Right now, you want to know your identity before God the Father? You're a saint. And it says that the Holy Spirit is praying for every single saint, Christian on earth, and he keeps praying God's will. Out of all that amazing truth, then Paul, under the power of the Spirit, pens one of the most significant hope-giving verses in the whole Bible and one of the most misused and messed up verses in the whole Bible. Everyone ready? Romans 8, 28. Someone I'm sure has posted it on Instagram this week. And we know 
that in all things God works for, those, works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Okay, let me start with the good. We know, not we hope, we know, not we suppose, we, we know, not we wish it's true, we know. Because of God's character and his promises, we know that all things will work out for those who love him, those that have relationship with him through the work of Jesus, through the power and presence of the Spirit. Now, what does it mean everything's going to work out for good? Does it mean that everything in my life is going to be great? No. This is where so many Christians misuse this verse. This is an ultimate statement, not an everyday statement. See, the ultimate good is our full-on salvation. And our salvation is rooted in the eternity, which verse 29 and verse 30 are all about. So verse 28, 29, 30, many call this the golden chain of freedom. These truths show us salvation, and God does everything and we do nothing. Everyone ready? So let me read verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, those who have been, highlight, circle this, called according to his purpose. Number one, if you're a Christian, you are called. And you're not called based on who you are or where you come from or your skin color. No, no, you're called because God chooses to do it. It's a God act through and through. Jesus said this in Matthew twenty two fourteen, For many are invited, few are chosen. F.F. Bruce, the famous New Testament scholar of the last generation, said, this calling is called effective calling, which is the work of God's Spirit convicts us of our sin, shows us our misery, enlightens our mind to who Jesus is, renews our will, he persuades and evil enables you to embrace Jesus freely offered in the gospel. Now hold on to your hats. The next few verses get exciting, a little offensive, difficult, and very freeing. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that's Jesus, that he might be the firstborn from among many brothers. Okay, foreknew is a very profound idea. Now, honest Christians disagree with what this word means. Many believe this means God knows every person's decision in the future. Who's going to say yes and no to Jesus? And so he calls us in a passive way based on what we're going to do in the future. Other Christians go, no, no, this is wrong. Becoming Christian is ultimately rooted in God's free choice because God is the one who has to bring us to life because we're spiritually dead. So you're like, well, John, which one is it? Box one or box two? Well, number one, no matter where you land, we're all going to hang out in heaven, so it's going to be fine. But I really believe it's box two. And why? Because the word itself leans that way. The word for no means means intimately to know someone. And when you read it in the original language, it's active. The person doing the foreknowing is actively doing it. It's not passive. This this isn't just awareness. In the Old Testament, this word is used as as, as a word to talk about sex and marriage. You know your partner. It's not just a passive thing. It's an active thing. So this is not about... This is about, not about foresight. I know what's going to happen. It's foreordination. I'm doing this thing. This idea is found right out of Amos 3.2. This is what God says to the Jewish people. You only have I known, chosen, sympathized with, loved, out of all the families of the earth. Paul here, just in the language, means I have chosen you beforehand. God has done everything needed to secure your salvation and glory. The calling, of course, happened after the fall. Okay, thinking caps on. We just need to go back for a moment. Remember in chapter 5, we all freaked out a little bit, and we talked about sin, Romans 5.12, remember? Therefore, just do this with me, as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. Remember, all have sinned. When you read that in the original language, it's a complete action done in the past. Paul is saying that all human beings sinned as a complete action in one point of history, no exceptions. Paul is basically saying, I, John Thompson, personally sinned in Adam. I was there by proxy. Adam was our representative. Adam, as one wrote, acted as the representative of the entire human race. He stands at the head of the human race. He's placed in the garden, not just to act for himself, 
but all future descendants. Just like the federal government has a chief spokesperson who's the head of a nation, Adam is the federal head of all human beings. The idea is when Adam sinned, he sinned for all of us. His fall, our fall, our fall, his fall. When God punished Adam and took away original righteousness, we were also punished. Remember I said this, and I was sort of joking, but was sort of not? I said, if our prime minister, no matter your opinion of him, declares war on the United States, I ask the question, are you at war with the United States? So I'm not at war. I don't agree with him. Irrelevant. He actually is our federal head. And actually, if he declares war in a country, we all as Canadians are at war because he actually represents us. Whether we believe that or not, it is true. So the same here. Our modern tendency is me, my choices, my will, my story, my narrative. No, no. Not when it comes to sin, separation, and salvation. So we all had free choice in Eden. We all lost free choice connected to salvation in Eden. And God calls some back. All of us had a choice to stay in relationship or alienation, heaven or hell. And in Adam, we chose the latter. And in mercy, he calls some back. And also God predestined, which means to set apart, to appoint, to determine ahead of it, to limit. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Since we're called and predestined, then we, through Jesus, get justified. Justified is a legal term meaning we are now in good standing with God. We were guilty because of sin and because of the work of Jesus and what he took on our behalf, we are now legally okay and not guilty. And then here's the real one. And we are glorified. This is also written fully in the past tense. So everyone that's called... Everyone that believes in Jesus, everyone who has the Spirit, already is glorified, which means you are eternally secure and you can never lose your salvation if it's real because it's already happened in the past and it's done. Let me put it like this. God called me. I came to faith in Jesus. So I know I've been called and it cannot be taken away because I believe in Jesus. I would not believe in Jesus if he had not called me. Did you catch it? Seem you're like, ooh, I'm struggling. I know. But here's the amazing thing. When you root your salvation in all of that, oh, you get free. Let me keep going. What then shall we say in response to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If God gave us Jesus... If the Father called us and Jesus died for us and was risen for us and he prays for us and if the Spirit lives in us and seals for us and he's praying for us, how will we not be given all benefits and all blessings because God loves us that much? You know, it's uh, Martin Luther's um, right hand, a guy named Philip Melanchthon. Actually, he, when he was dying on his deathbed, yelled out verse 32 as his final words. I mean, that's profound. And then it's like, since all of that's true, Paul gets sort of like defiant in a good way, defiant to the world, defiant to the devil, defiant to sin, and says, verse 33, who's going to bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who, who's going to give us an official summons? Who's going to take us to court and say, oh, not, not really saved, you know, still sinful? Who's more powerful, Paul says, more all-knowing than God who's already made us right? Who's going to take us to task? You want to fight with me? You want to go with me? Talk to my father who called me. You talk to Jesus, my brother, who died for me. You talk to the Holy Spirit who lives in me. He won God. He's done everything. You deal with him, not with me. That's why he says, who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ, who died more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for us. Oh my goodness, have you thought about this? Jesus was our substitution Jesus is our resurrection, Jesus is our ascension, and Jesus is our ongoing intercession. The Son of God is praying for you right now, and the Holy Spirit is praying for you right now, and this never ends. His perfect prayers are always for you, for us. And then, of course, we get to this amazing group of verses that so many people love, and they should. So who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? See, you can't actually get to that verse with real power until you go through the calling thing and the predestination thing and the glorification thing and the justification. Who's going to separate me from the love of Christ? Trouble? Hardship? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? uh, Nakedness? Danger? Sword? Oh no, it's written in the Old Testament. For your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered sheep as to be slaughtered. No, no, and all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. No, no, I am convinced. I know that I know that I know that death, life, angels, demons, 
present, future, power, height, depth, anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Death isn't going to pull me away from God and life and all of its sort of... (laughs) All of its offerings aren't going to do that. No, the demonic, cosmic power, good things, great things, bad things, political power, spiritual power, things in heaven or in hell, disappointment, neurosis, psychosis, insanity, disease, broken romances, lost dreams, financial crisis, accident, shame, regret, persecution, lack of food, lack of freedom. No, nothing that has been done to me or I have done to others, big, small, sin, public, private, uh, uh, listen, not old age, not disability, nothing in time, nothing in the expanse of space, nothing known, nothing unknown, nothing in the universe can sever me, take me, steal me from God's love that's given to me by the Father bought by Jesus and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Period. (laughs) That's where the power of the Christian gospel comes home. You know, it's amazing. There was an incredible Christian leader in the third century called uh, John Chrysostom. I think I said it right. One of the most, I think it's the third century, one of the most famous preachers in 2,000 years. He he actually had the, the nickname of Golden Mouth because he was such a profound preacher. And he understood this. He was brought in his day before the Roman Empire, Emperor, the most powerful man on earth who literally held death and life in his hands. And the emperor threatened him with banishment if he remained a Christian. Christian, this bishop, this is how he responded. You can't banish me for this world is my father's house. Oh. Then the emperor said, then fine, I'm going to kill you. No, you can't. For my life is hid with Christ and God. Well, I'm going to take your wealth. No, you can't do that either for my treasures in heaven and my heart is there. Well, then I'm going to drive you away from people. You're going to have a friend left. Well, no, you can't do that either for I have a friend in heaven and you can never separate me from him. Well, I defy you, he says. There is nothing that you can do to truly hurt me. That's a man, that's a Christian that truly understood Romans 8 for real. Why is this so important? Number one, The Bible doesn't play games and doesn't invent fantasies. The pain, the labor, the groaning before the good is real. But we have to continually see it through the pages of Scripture. Years ago, an older pastor said these words, and these are going to be life-giving, really life-giving for some of you. He said, don't assume your suffering is a result of God's punishment. Do expect when suffering ends, he's going to give you greater joy. Let me read that again. Don't assume that your suffering is a result of God's punishment. Do expect that when suffering ends, there will be greater joy. Don't assume God has abandoned you. Do confess your fear and your doubt and ask him for strength to press on. Oh, don't assume you've been rejected and forsaken by God. Do remain faithful to your duties, even if you have to reduce your load for a time being. That's okay. Don't assume your prayers are not heard. Do continue praying, even when you don't know what to say. Know what to say. And by the way, I've been in that position many times where I just am so overwhelmed, I don't know what to pray. And I've literally said, I know Jesus, you pray perfect prayers. And Holy Spirit, I know you pray perfect prayers. So you've got to step in because I don't know what to say anymore. I love when he says, do not assume that your suffering gives you permission to give up, but do trust that the Lord will magnify his strength through your weakness. The scriptures don't dismiss the pain of life, reduce the groans of life, dismiss the labor, but it puts it into perspective. Sit with us this week and see if you can find a new perspective and some freedom. But let me end where I must today. Hear again what God actually says over you if you're a Christian. You're not a rootless tree. You're not alone. You're not left to suffer alone. Jesus, who sits at the right hand of Father above all things, is praying for all of us now. He's always forgiving. He's always pleading. He's always dealing with our ungodliness. He's always dealing with that through His love and holiness. The Holy Spirit is in you, not beside you, He's in you. He helps you in weakness. He's praying for you. He's praying for us. He struggles alongside of us. 
He loves us more than we love ourselves. He gives us power to live the Christian life. You are called. You're foreknown. You're predestined. You're justified. You're already glorified. You can't lose your salvation because it was never up to you in the first place. You're glorified now. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. No, no, really. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Our identity can never be eroded or taken away because you are and were and always will be a saint. You're a child of God. We've got hope. Who's going to bring a charge against us? No one is stronger than the one that called us, lives in us, and prays for us. And never forget, it's not just about us. This is about the whole ball game. This is about creation. I love when someone said, nowhere else in the New Testament do we have a text quite like this, dealing with the fall and restoration, not just of human beings, but literally the whole world. God is going to come back when Jesus returns. He is literally going to make creation right. No more shadow and dark. It's done. But we have to choose as Christians to live, walk, and make decisions through this lens. Hope is in the now, and hope is coming in much larger ways. Ground your Christian life here. So, Father, thanks for calling us. I know a lot of us struggle with calling and predestination election, but no matter where we land, thank you that you called us. Because we sure weren't really looking for you. Thank you, Jesus, for just dying for us, being risen again, uh, praying for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, you choose to keep living in us even though we grieve you all the time. Thank you that you pray for us when we don't know what to pray. Thank you that you showed us Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, you showed us the Father. Thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. I'm going to ask Father and Son, you send the Holy Spirit and this would grow deeper and wider in so many people listening that this would just grip their soul, grip their identity, grip their mind, grip their thoughts, grip their dreams, grip their past, present, and future. Hope in Jesus' name. Hope in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and give hope to our church and those beyond in the name of Christ. Lord, thank you for this. And also, just thank you, you're going to make all things right. Help us, Lord, even as Christians, to care for your world in the interim. But thank you that no matter what happens, it's all going to be made right again. I'm just, I'm praying in Jesus' name for the fruit of the Spirit and that gift called hope. Just give us hope, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.